Most people think that worship is something we only do on Sunday mornings. But God wants our lives to be a living testimony to Him as well as to others. Today, Pastor Terry introduces a new series entitled, Gripped by the Greatness of God. It will be an in-depth study of the mightiness of God and what our worship towards Him should be. This week's message will show how we can deal with the overwhelming troubles and circumstances of life by simply using the weapons of praise and worship. These two pieces of artillery will help you break through the heaviness so that transformation can take place. You will begin to see the beauty and greatness of God. Your faith will rise up and your spirit will begin to sing. Let's now join Terry as he presents The Power of Praise. We're starting a new series this week and it's called Gripped by the Greatness of God. Um, in preparing for this, I, I got to tell you, it's kind of a heart-wrenching thing. Today's sermon is, is, is not the heart-wrenching one, but the ones to, to come are a real testing of what true worship is. I got to be honest with you. In studying it, the church has been sold a bad goods of what worship is. And I'm not just talking about music. I'm talking about our lives. I'm telling you right now, the church does not really understand what true worship is. It's like, well, what makes you think you know? The Bible's telling me, and I've been studying it, and I'm telling you, it's, just, it's a whole new aspect, a whole new attitude, and it's going to be challenging. Now that I say the word challenging to you, you better show up, okay? <laughs> he says it's going to be challenging. I'm staying home today. No, don't do that. God wants a church that's so on fire for him and so in love with him and sees him for who he truly and really is. And when we see that, that makes a difference in who we are. That makes a difference in how we react. I'm telling you the truth. It will cause us even to lay down our lives for Jesus Christ. Literally. So I just want to encourage you to be a part of this. It's called Grip by the Greatness of God. But today, I want to talk about the power of praise. The power of praise. Say that with me. The power of praise. You know there's power in praising God? <clears throat> there is power in praising God. God created us. And for some reason or another, when he, we are created, we have this, this need to worship something or somebody. We do. We always have this desire to worship. And if we are not worshiping God, we will worship man. And if we will worship what man makes. Or we'll worship God's creation instead of the creator. Or we'll worship ourselves. We are built to worship and God says put your attention and focus on me on my greatness and I'll do great things in your life I want to talk about the power of praise in our lives today there is power in worshiping God say that with me there is power in worshiping God there is true power most of us think worship is something that we do just on Sunday morning it's not it is a lifestyle but today I want to focus on just that aspect in our lives where we pray to God and we sing his praises and how that has a powerful effect on our lives. We could talk about worship for months. You know, you're going to be doing it for eternity. So I don't think we could cover it in one or two or three weeks or even a couple months. We are going to be worshiping God for eternity. And when we see God, remember, God is infinite. How many mathematicians do we have in here knows what the word infinite means? There is no end to it. You can't even attain it. You can't even think it. You can't even fathom. There is no end. It's infinite. Infinite does not have an end. God is infinite. God is infinite. And we always wonder why the angels and, and the 24 elders, they keep crying out to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they do it again and again. It's because every single time they look up and they think they're done praising God, they see a different attribute of God, a powerful, gripping attribute of God that causes them to go back to their knees and say, I am not worthy. You're holy. You're awesome, God. I love you. And that's eternity. So I want to talk about the power. There is spiritual warfare that happens when we, do pray, when we do worship. Do you know that worship aids us in spiritual warfare? It aids us in fighting the devil? You may never think that. But when we pray in there, right before we come out, we take the worship team, we take the prayer team, and uh, we take the media team, and we all go in there and we pray for each other. And one of the things that we do pray is, Lord, I pray that we would do warfare today through praise and worship, that the bondages that people come in in their lives, that they just feel down, Lord, that it'll be broken because of the praise and worship of our God. 
Worship is spiritual warfare. Worship and praise of Almighty God gives us victory over our enemy. Today, I just want to give you one example, example in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is full of it, full of all kinds of stories of the power of praise. But this particular one comes out of uh, Jer- uh, Jehoshaphat. How many of you guys have heard that guy named Jehoshaphat? I, I recommend that as the name for your next child. It's a great name. Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Good luck in spelling it. <laughs> Jehoshaphat. And uh, actually, I'm trying to find out. It's found in Second Chronicles 20. That's what I'm going to be reading. And I put it up here on the screen. But I just want you to follow along as I read this. Je- First of all, I'll just give you a little background history of who Jehoshaphat is. Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of the southern kingdom, Judah. He was the fourth king. His dad's name was Azza, I think it was. And his dad was a godly man. And he worshiped God. And he loved the Lord. And his son followed in his footsteps. You know, fathers, that's a lesson right there. And as Todd so wonderfully did a great job today saying, you know what, as we worship God, our children will do the same thing. And that's why we brought our children back in for a season with us, you know, so that they can worship and then they go back and experiment, and experiment themselves in worship. Let them see you worshiping God in the house of God. I mean, they may not see you worshiping God at home. They may not see you dancing and praising God at home or shouting or clapping but let them at least see it at church, amen? It should be all the way. I, 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 I'm sorry I said it that way. My point is this. They should see us worshiping God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength in church service. So I encourage you guys to do it. Now, oh man, Terry, I'm not one of those guys who likes to whoop it up. I'm not one of those guys who likes to shout and dance. And I, Actually, I don't like singing. I like to watch people sing. Uh, you know, was, you, we've, we've had those, and I'm not slamming you, but I'm just telling you, God wants something out of us, and there's something that when we do something physical, it attaches itself to the spiritual, and it does great things. It releases power in our life. It releases the victory of God in your life, and that's what I want to talk about today. So Jehoshaphat, he was 30, 35 years old when he became king. It's good to be king. He reigned for 25 years, and in Second Chronicles 22, 9, it says this. It describes his character as one who sought the Lord with all of his heart. He made mistakes. If you read the, uh, the previous chapters, you see the mistakes that Jehoshaphat made and how he relied on other kings to help him in battles and how he did wrong things. But it's a man who came back to God. It's always coming back to God, worshiping God. Early in his reign, Jehoshaphat, he sought the Lord in all kinds of ways. He sent, here's what he did. When he became king, he says, you know what? This kingdom needs to know God and need to know God in a greater way. So he sent out men to all the cities and all the provinces to teach people the word of God, to teach people the, what God has spoken to them. And so they went out, they taught the laws, and he talked to the judges. He said, judges, you better, fair, you better judge fairly. You better judge rightly. And because of this, because he sought the Lord, God blessed Jehoshaphat's reign. He re- and, and he became wealthy, and his enemies, the Bible says that fear came over all of his enemies. They were afraid to attack this guy. They were afraid to have war with him. And some of them even came and gave him gold, gave him sheep, gave him all these things and gave tribute to him. It's amazing. When we praise God, when we live our lives for God with all of our hearts, the great things that happen. People say, well, I've lived God for God all my life and bad things happen to me. You know what? <laughs> Just check the heart here today. Let's check the heart. Let's be very, very real today. You know, there is, a, there is when you live for God, there is a, a blessing that comes with it. You will go through trials, you'll go through tribulations, you'll go through some troubles, but there is a blessing attached to those who live for God with all their heart. And Jehoshaphat had that. Lots of wealth, lots of land, and no war during his reign until the very end there. God blessed him. Now, towards the end, the enemy did attack. Can I tell you this? (laughs) The enemy is going to attack you. How many of you guys already know that? The enemy is going to attack. We we, we talked about... uh, Marvin and Patty, the, the enemy's attacking them, and maybe in your life today, the enemy's been attacking you in some way, attacking your family, attacking your thoughts, attacking your relationships, attacking you, trying to steal God's love out of your heart. Second Chronicles 20, verse 1. The people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and the others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came out and told Jehoshaphat, saying, and they came to the king and they said, man, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria. And they are in Hazazon, Tamar, and Jehoshaphat feared. What's happening here? All these kings are mustering their armies together and they're coming against Jehoshaphat and all Israel there, all Judah, coming against them. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that Jehoshaphat's heart, he feared. 
Guys, can I tell you, it's okay to fear. It's okay all of a sudden to see something and be afraid. Don't, don't sit there, I'm not afraid. I'm, you know, you're afraid. What should you do? What should you do with that fear? Should you just dwell on it? She, here's what Jehoshaphat did. It says this. He sought the Lord. The next verse it says, and he set himself to seek the Lord. When something comes in your life and it causes fear in your life, the first thing you should do is seek the Lord. Don't just go seeking advice. I mean, you have godly friends, seek their advice, amen. But first thing, you get on your knees and say, Lord, help me in this situation. I don't know how many times when I'm in a situation that I'm afraid, whatever it may be, maybe it's something in my mind or something very real. If I go to God and I start praising him, that fear just kind of disappears. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a, a power and a sound mind. Hallelujah. So we should not live in that fear. Go to God immediately with that fear. Nothing wrong with being afraid, but seek God. And he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. I mean, this guy's serious. It's not just prayer, but he's just saying, you know what? Everybody in the nation, let's fast. Let's pray. Let's, let's seek God with all of our hearts because this is important. This is, this is super important. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. He sought God right away. Can you imagine the mighty praise worship that happened at this point? All these people here in the praising God. Next verse, verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, and here he is praying to God and praising God even. First of all, he says this. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hands, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people of Israel and gave it, as in, gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it. And have you built your sanctuary in it for your name saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple in the presence for your name is in this temple and cry out to you, in our afflictions, and you will hear and save us. Here, what is Jehoshaphat doing? First of all, he's praising God. He's naming, he's describing all the great attributes of God. Man, didn't you do this? He's, he's calling up history. Lord, didn't you just do this? Didn't you do that for our fathers? Didn't you do that for my family at one time? Didn't you do this for my church? Didn't you do this for my city? Didn't you do this? Aren't all the power in your hands? No one can come against you. What they're doing is they're taking their eyes off of that situation which is so scary and so real and they're putting it on God who's so big and so real too. They're taking their eyes off the problems and they're putting it on the problem solver. Amen? They're taking their eyes off that thing that is small and they're putting their eyes on something that's so much bigger, God Almighty. That's what they're doing. He's praising. He's what he's doing. He's remembering and he's rec recalling all the things of God. You know, the devil would love to have us remember all the bad things and we just focus on those things. As a matter of fact, we focus on them so bad that we'll get on Facebook or we'll get on tw Twitter or we'll get on a text and we just start talking about it and talking about it. How many of you guys have ever met people, they say something bad happens in their life and then someone goes, well, yeah, well, you ought to hear what happened to me and they tell their story. It's like all of a sudden there's this competition who had the worst, stinkiest life in the world. You know what I'm talking about? Who's ever had people like that? Don't look at the person next to you, okay? You know, we've had those situations like, man, you know, I remember one time my... We was uh, at a Bible study, and uh, I was younger. I wasn't married at the time, so I wasn't as wise as I am today because <laughs> my wife has made me wise. So anyway, yeah, no one bought that. How's it going? <laughs> oh, anyway, we was in this place, and everyone was talking about their lives and their, and their relationship with their parents and how their parents abused them. And these were Christians, and each story got worse and worse and worse, and I'm in this Bible study going, ugh, ugh, ugh. You know, I'm not hating it. I'm, I'm feeling terrible. And when it came to time to me, all I could do is praise my God for how I was raised by my family. All I could do is praise God for my godly parents and my godly uh, mom and dad and how they raised us in the fear of God and the love of God. And all of a sudden, that whole room just went, Rawr! and everyone stopped thinking about how bad their life was and their focus was on God. Their focus was on God. Listen, if we look at that problem, if we text about that problem, we, we put it on Facebook and we just talk about it and talk about it, that's going to be your problem, that's going to be your God and that's what you're going to get. You get what you worship and you're worshiping that very thing, that very terrible thing in your life. Put your focus on God. 
Say it with me. Put your focus on God. One more time. Put your focus on God. What he's done for you. What he will do for you. And the promises that he has for you. Hallelujah. That was a freebie. That wasn't in here. Okay, here we go. The king's prayer, became, he, uh, he praised him for who he was, what he did, and the king's prayer became very specific. Verse 10, and here, here he goes. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But now they've turned from them and did not, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming out to throw us out of your possession. Here's, here, he's saying, is, look, we didn't attack them. We did what you told us to, God. But now look at them. Here they are repaying the kindness that we've done for them. And now they're fighting us. Verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no, listen to this. For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do. Isn't that being real? Don't be fakey. Be real. God, they're greater than us. They're smarter than us, they're more powerful than us, and we don't know what to do. <laughs> we don't know what to do. But Lord, he says this, but our eyes are upon you. But our eyes are upon you. We are absolutely dependent upon you, God. You know what that is? Worship is an admission of dependency. That's what worship is. I need you. I need you. Church, if we can't say I need you to God, then we're worshiping ourselves in our own might and our own strength. And it will fail you, I promise. And you will fail other people. And other people will fail you. Put your hope in God. Put your eyes upon God. God responds, verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon, I'm going to try my best, Jehaz, Jehaziel. Jehaziel. Yeah, that's pretty good. The son of all these other people. Okay, verse 15. Here's Jehaziel. And Jehaziel said, Listen, all of you of Judah. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. God's responding to this prayer. God's responding to their praise. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not need to fight in this battle. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. Imagine this. Put it this way. Imagine there's this huge group of bullies that's constantly bullying you. Constantly threatening, threatening you. Remember as a little kid. Think as a, think as a little kid, the fears that comes upon those. I'm going to beat you up. If you don't, you know, I'm, 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 what did I do? What did I do? I don't know, but I just don't like you. I'm going to beat you up. Isn't right, that right? Cronies? Yeah, yeah. We're gonna, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Can you see this happening now? You, I'm, I'm actually telling you my life story right here. <laughs> but here we are. We have these guys going to say, we're going to beat you to a pulp. We don't like you. Never have. So what do you do? Well, you go to someone bigger. <laughs> you go to someone who's experienced. You go to someone who can take on these guys. And if, suppose someone comes up to you and says, you know what? Hey, Terry, you don't have to worry about it. I'll be there with you, and I'll take care of these guys. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's what God is doing here. These guys are coming at you. Don't you dare fear them. Don't worry about it. I'm with you. I am with you. He's not telling them don't fear just not to fear. It's going to be okay. I am with you. I will do the fighting for you. The battle is mine, not yours. I'll take care of these punks. That's what God is saying. That's what God is saying. Hallelujah. When, he get, when we give it to God, when we give God our troubles and our problems, we got to leave it with God, and God will take care of it for you, and he will fight our battles. Verse 18, and here's the response. The response that happens should happen in our lives too when we hear God speaking to us. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What a heart. Thank you that you're so big and strong. Thank you that nothing is greater than you. Then the Levites of the children of Kohathites and the children of Korahites stood up to praise the Lord of 
God of Israel with voices loud and high. So what happens? All of a sudden, all these people stood up and just started singing the praises of God. They started worshiping God out loud with their voices, high, loud, proclaiming God's goodness. I'm sure they, I'm sure, think of it, think of it this way. If this was going to happen to you, and you knew he was going to die the next day, and all of a sudden, this huge army comes in, and there's no way anyone could defeat this army. You would be excited. You would be dancing. You would be shouting. Yeah! You'd be excited. That's what God is doing here, and we should respond the same way to God. We should not respond like, oh, thank you. I'm going to go back to sleep now. <laughs> Start praising God. Start worshiping God. That's where our victory comes from. Personally hearing from God invokes physical response called worship. Verse 20. So they rose early in the morning, and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, and here, here he is, talk to all the people, hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. What does that mean? The New Living, the New Living Translation says it this way, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in God. Believe in the promises of God. Believe in the prophets and you will succeed. Believe in his word and you will succeed. Verse 21. And when they had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army and were singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. What's happening? He says, you know what, guys? It's God's battle, so we don't need our weapons. Let's take all the singers. Let's put them out front in front of the army as we go out to meet these people because we're going to watch God whoop on them, okay? All these singers, all these musicians, all these people praising God went out worshiping God, and they followed them out to the battlefield. Hallelujah. That should be our response. Our response should not just be give it to God and go back into worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying. Give it to God and go back to worry, worry. See, that's not giving it to God. Give it to God and say, thank you, God. Thank, and start focusing on his attributes and his power and his name and his might and his promises. Hallelujah. And so that's what they did. They were in front of the fighters. And they didn't bring any weapons to this battle. Verse 22. Now when they began to sing and to praise, listen to this. The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And then they had, and when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, and they looked towards the multitude, and there were dead bodies fallen on the ground. No one had escaped. What had happened? <laughs> that praise and worship, that singing, caused God's angels to go forth and cause confusion in the camp of the enemy to the point that fear probably gripped them and they started fighting each other. Two groups fought one, utterly destroyed them. When they were dead, they looked at each other and they started whooping on each other until they were all dead. Can you imagine the last guy? The Bible says none of them survived. Not a single one survived. And this was a massive, massive army. The battle was God's. The battle was God's. And when we set out praising God, God does the fighting on our behalf. Hallelujah. God also takes the fear out of our lives. Praise God. Not only was there victory but there was pow over the powerful enemy, but there was also a blessing. Verse 25. Check this out. There was victory, but there was a blessing. See, you know, what the devil wants to do bad in your life, God takes it and moves it. And when we worship him and we give him praise, God takes it and twists it and does it for our good. They came, at, they came after all these, uh, the Judah, and they came to destroy them. But God fought the battle, and then God took all their plunder and gave it to the Israelites. Check this out. Verse 25, and when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of a valuable on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off of themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days <laughs> gathering the spoil because there was so much. Can you imagine this? Boy, I would have taken just a victory. But to have three days worth of spoil in addition to that, that is a mighty God church. That is not a little God who just gives us barely what we need, but he gives us abundantly above all that we should ever even ask of him. That is the God that we serve. Three days. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of uh, Beracha, and, and there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Beracha. Uh, Berachach, I don't know how to pronounce it, until this day. And then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, with Jehoshaphat in front of them, to go back to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. 
So they came to Jerusalem with singing instruments, with stringed instruments, harps, and trumpets to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. They continued to worship their God. Continue to worship God. Today, let me apply this to our lives today. Because if the word of God, if it's anything, it's applicable to every aspect of our life. It has to be. Today, you and I are involved in great spiritual warfare. We have a great enemy. An enemy that's smarter than us. Enemy that's more powerful than us. Craftier than us. And we don't know what to do. We don't know how to respond. Who is that enemy, church? Satan. Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We have an enemy today who wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. That is your spiritual enemy. And he wants to do it to your family. He wants to do it to your children. He wants to do it to your wife and your husband. He wants to do it to your family. It's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. Listen to this. Ephesians 6, 12 says this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What do we wrestle against? Who do we fight? Wrestle. We, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Do you see this vast army I just described right, right there? Against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You have a huge army surrounding you today, church. I want to kill you. What should our response be? Should our response be just to ignore it? Hoping that maybe they'll just go on beside us and leave us alone and maybe go after you guys. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> should that be our response? Should we hide? Should we? No, our response should be, we praise God. We should seek God. This enemy is greater than us. You know, sometimes I think we lay down and quit too easy as Christians. God never meant for us to lay down and quit. He never did. He meant for us to live victorious lives. Spiritual battles cannot be won through physical weapons. So how do we fight the devil? What, what, what caliper of pistol is going to take out the devil? Well, you don't use pistols. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you don't use guns. You don't use tenonite. You don't use any of these other things to take care of them. Here's what we do in 2 Corinthians 10. It says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war against the flesh. The people that come at you, accuse you, hateful to you, they're not your enemy. They're being used by the enemy. They're being manipulated by the enemy. I'm not saying they're possessed by the enemy. I am saying this, but they are being manipulated just like you and I get manipulated at times. So should our battle be against our wives? Should our battle be against our children when they make us mad? Should our battle be against our boss for the way he treated us? Should our battle be against those who are on uh, the web talking bad about us? Should we put them down? Is that our battle? Is it physical there? No. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not physical, they're not earthly, but they are mighty in God for doing what? For pulling down strongholds. Pulling down strongholds. See what the devil wants to do? Let me finish, go on here, it says this. Um, For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, to the obedience of Christ. See, our enemy comes at us this way. He comes at us through arguments that happen in our mind. He does. You guys are sitting right here, maybe you've, I know you've experienced, every one of us has experienced this because no one's immune from, immune from the attack of the devil, not even Jesus Christ. Don't, so don't, I don't want to see people saying, well, I, my life is so good and I, I'm always in the Lord that the devil doesn't even mess with me. Well, that means you're no threat to the devil. <laughs> the devil attacked Jesus Christ. He'll attack you and I. The enemy comes at us through arguments in our minds against God. Here's what he'll do. he say, God is not as good as he says he is. I, you know, I don't feel God is as good as he says he is. God doesn't love you like he loves that family over there. God doesn't love your family like that. It's because you messed up so many times that God can't forgive you. God can't forgive you. Matter of fact, God is, he's through with you. He's over with you. You messed up too many times. Do you see this? Can you see God? Can you see Jesus over here saying, that's not true. That's not true. Think of it in your own life. If someone came up to you and was talking about your spouse or talking about your children saying, you know what? They don't really love you the way they say they do because I've seen, I heard them talk. I've heard them uh, act a certain way. I've heard them respond a certain way and the way they roll their eyes. Everything about them just says they don't love you. 
And then here your family, can you imagine that if they said that about you and you're over here saying, that's not true, I love you, I love you. And they were believing the lie of that person who was telling them about the lies about you. That's the way it is with the devil. That's the way it is with the devil. He's lying about Jesus. He's lying about God. He did it from Adam and Eve to this very day. That's what he does. He impugns God's goodness. He puts it down. He lies. Everything about him is a lie. He is a father of lies and everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. Amen? So when you feel these things about God that go contrary to the word of God, but the word of God says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he doesn't want any to perish, but all to have everlasting life. Well, yeah, them, but not you. Them, but not your husband. You see, see the lies? Devil, that's the biggest battleground right here is in our mind. And what we need to do is fill it with our focus on God. Fill it with the word of God. Fill it with the promises of God. Fill it with the truth of God. The truth will set you free. Hallelujah. Our enemy comes at us with arguments about his goodness and his greatness. His greatness. You know, yeah, God made great, but you know what? He doesn't do miracles like he did in the Old Testament. How many of you guys have ever thought that? I wish that God did miracles like he did in the Old Testament. God is still the same God. It's not like he's tired. It's like, oh, I, I, I already spent it on the Old Testament people. You guys are on your own. That's not God. He's infinite, remember? Hallelujah. Enemy sets himself higher. He'll, he'll make his problems seem greater than what they really are. You ever see people who look at it? How about a child who has a splinter in their finger? And they look at that thing and all they do is stare at it and, and it just, to them, it's like, you know, their finger is just ready to fall off. You know what I'm saying? It just grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. When we focus on that thing, that's what the devil wants us to do. He gives us an argument. He makes us focus on him and he thinks how powerful he is and how powerful the situation is and how we can't overcome it, how it's going to overcome us. What he's doing, he's causing, he's exalting himself higher above God and that's not true. Enemy sets himself higher, greater, mightier, stronger. Hallelujah. We should not believe this. These are all lies. God calls us to praise God, calls us to worship God. And I want to give you real quick a couple of scriptures. Write this down if you would. If you want to, write this down. And what's going to happen next time you come across this enemy attacking your mind, the enemy lying, here's how we should respond to that. <laughs> what's going to do is when the enemy comes, it should drive us to worship God, number one. Just like Jehoshaphat. Focus on God. Worship God. Remember God. Praise God. Thank God. That's what it should do. The next time the enemy comes, here's our response. These are biblical expressions of praise and worship. Verse, Hebrews 13, 15 says, declare, uh, declare of, uh, declaration of thanks. Start thanking God. Say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you love me. Thank you, God, that your promises are yes and amen, and they're true, and they'll never change. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you, God, that you love me. Just remember those things. Thank him. That should be the first thing in praise. So when the devil comes, start praising God. And say, thank you, Lord, that, you, that you're here, that you're with me. Next thing, clapping hands and shouting. You know, whenever you have a victory or whenever you want to praise, don't you guys get excited? Like, yeah! Yeah! How many of you guys have ever done that, Okay. Can we do that for God? Can we do that for the promises of God? When all of a sudden we feel like this, this world has just overcome us, just start clapping and praising God. What's going to happen? When you start clapping, every time we clap, that's going to cause the devil to go, stop it, stop it, stop it. Who's ever had a migraine and someone comes in and starts clapping? Stop it. That's what's, give the devil a migraine. Next time he does that, start worshiping and clapping and praising God and shouting. Oh, great, there goes Terry again. He's shouting. Oh, must be quiet. Shout. I mean, it's a very physical thing. I want to give you a scripture here. I can't wait to give you the scripture coming up. But I just want to give you a couple more. Singing praise songs. Turn on the music. Start, don't just listen to it. You sing it. Let it come out of your mouth. Let it come out of your soul and worship God. Instead of like, uh, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Start saying, hallelujah, my God is greater. My God is stronger. He is mightier. He's the healer. All these songs that we sing today, sing the word of God. Songs, uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Making a joyful noise. What's a joyful noise? <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. What's your joyful noise? Yahoo. You know, make a joyful noise. It could be singing. Maybe your singing is noise, as Todd was talking about this morning. But the thing is this. Make a noise. You know, see all this stuff? All this stuff is a physical thing. We're using our bodies to do spiritual warfare. That's amazing. By lifting up our hands. I remember when Valerie Carell, when she first... 
uh, came here. She talked about, she, saw, she came in and, uh, during worship and she saw people raising their hands. Freaked her out. Didn't know she'd ever come back again. But something brought her back. It might have been her husband. I don't know. But something drew her back. And she says, before long, she did not realize it at one point in one of the worship sets that she had her hands raised. Oh my goodness, I'm one of them! You know what I'm saying? Actually, I have a video sometime I want to show you. It's, it's, uh, it's one of these comedians. He talks about the different phases of worship. One of them is like a, you know, if maybe, maybe you've never used your hands in worship. Start out like this. You can start, do the arm flap. Do the arm flap, you know. And then when you, when you feel brave about that, then next thing, carry the TV. Let's carry the TV right here. Carry the TV. Big screen, big screen. Yeah, make it big screen. Next thing you know is, I caught a fish this big. I caught a fish this big. Hallelujah. Lie about it. I caught a fish this big. Hold the baby. Hold the baby. Mufasa. <laughs> the circle of... Okay, anyway, but hold the baby, you know? The next thing you know... Now, now, I don't know where it goes on from there. Next thing you know, it goes, uh, you, you, you go like this, you raise your hand. It's, it's like, what is it? Oh, there's a touchdown. There's all kinds of things. There's, there's, there's Rocky, there's touchdown, and I don't know what else. God, you know, these are just some of the things we, we do. And next thing you know, you'll be raising your hands to God. You know what? This is a form of worship. This is a form of worship. This here will give you victory in some of the areas in your lives and the battles that you're encountering right now. This the singing, the declaring, the joyful noise, the shouting, the dancing. Do you see how we're using our body to do worship, to do spiritual warfare and have victory in our lives? It's not us doing the battle. When we do this, God does the battle. God does the fighting. God does the victory in our lives. Hallelujah. There's some more scriptures with that. Uh, uh, by being still. Sometimes it just worship is just like I just, in the presence of God, I just, I can't talk. I'm just in awe. I just let my heart pour out to him by being loud. These all have scriptures. Write them down. These are ways to worship God. And then when you worship God, what do you do in church? You're beating up the enemy. Amen? Musical instruments and dancing. Yes, musical instruments and dancing. These are ways of worshiping God. I want to give you a, a scripture. And this scripture says this. this is in Isaiah 30, 31 through 32, and it says this. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his rod, he will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing club, it will be to the music of tim uh, timbrels and harps as he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. Do you guys see what just happened there? This is worship. Ready? God says, I want to take my stick, my big ugly stick, and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to beat on the devil's head. Bam! Bam! But I'm going to do it to your tambourines. I'm going to do it to your dancing. I'm going to do it to your musical instruments. That's what he's saying. He says, I'm going to beat the devil, and I'm going to hit him again and again. I'm going to defeat the enemy in your life when you start worshiping me with your instruments, with your song, with your praise. That's what causes God's arm to do great things on our behalf. When we sit there and we do this and hope that he does, he can't. He can't. We tie his hands. He's saying, praise. Let me lower the boom on this guy. Praise me. That's what that scripture is saying. Let's read it one more time. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his rod, he will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing club. I like that punishing club. Will be, see, when I was growing up, <laughs> we would go on vacations, and Jimmy and I, and, and, and I'm sure the angel... Um, Ronnie and Misty, my sister and brother. Uh, but anyway, we would fight in the back and we would argue and all that kind of stuff and we'd make vacation miserable. My mom had what we called the ugly stick. Or was it the ouch stick? Oh yeah, it was ugly. So anyway, matter of fact, we even took it and we wrote things on there. Ouch, look out, here it comes, all that kind of stuff. And she would have that in her glove box. And every time we'd get, she'd pull that out and bring the boom down on us. Stop it, I told you to behave and I meant it. Look at this. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing club. <laughs> you want to hit the devil? How do you hit the devil? You don't hit the devil by going up and fighting with someone. You don't hit the devil by uh, being angry and, and doing things. You hit, you hit the devil by worshiping God. You hit the devil by worshiping God. 
with his punishing club will be to the music of timbrels and harps. Hallelujah. My, my goodness, not only do you get to beat the devil with a stick by worshiping God, but you get to do it to music. Oh, this is great. La, 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 la. Whatever it is, however you want to worship God, let God do it by, through your worship. What punishing club will be to the music of timbrels and harps as he fights them. He fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. Church, that is a powerful description of what praise should be in our lives. So the next time you are attacked, the next time you feel down and defeated and like you're not going to make it out of it, the next time some physical thing comes in your life, physical, sickness, mental, emotional, relational, financial, however the devil attacks you and he will attack you in every single one of those areas and already has, you start worshiping God. Say, God, you know, I, I thank you that you know my plight. I thank you that you know that I'm weak in this area. And Lord, I, I don't know how to respond to this. I don't know how to respond to this job situation, God. But I come to you and I worship you. You are the God. You're the God who takes care of me. You're the God who meets all my needs. You're the God who loves me. And you'll never forsake me. You'll let me falter and fall. I love you, God. Look at that. Your eyes are off that. And as you sing, God says, thank you so much. Thank you. Keep praising me. And he's beating the devil off of your back. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap on that one. <laughs> Praise sends the enemy running. When the devil hears the name of Jesus Christ being lifted up, he can't take it. He runs. The devil, our biggest enemy, our greatest enemy, he is so small in the sight of praise of our God. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Think of that. If you're, if you're being beat down and the devil's constantly whispering in your ear, you're at home, you're by yourself, you're doing the laundry, or maybe you're mowing the lawn or whatever it is, and the devil starts coming in with his lies once again, he starts doing that attack once again, you start praising God. And what happens? God comes in right there. And can you imagine the devil following you along as you're mowing the yard and he's whispering to you and telling you all these lies? And all of a sudden you, you're tired of it and you say, I'm not going to put up with this. I want to praise God. This isn't your, this isn't for you to play in devil. I'm going to praise God. Hallelujah. See how the devil drives you to praise and worship. And as you start praising God and as the devil's following you, here comes God alongside the devil. And what does the devil do? Oh, I, I got to go someplace else right now. I got to go over to uh, Barry's house. Okay, whatever. <laughs> don't, don't send him to anybody else's house. Send the devil back to hell from which he came. Amen. Where he's going. Where he's going. So God inhabits the praise of his people. When God comes in, the atmosphere changes. You know, and, and there's other scriptures in which I don't have time to go to today, but when God comes in, even the very organic nature of this planet changes. The planet produces better fruits. The planet produces more fruit. The weather becomes, isn't that amazing? You tell me the weather could change because I praise God? Absolutely. Yes. Because our God is in charge of all these things. There's everything answers to my God. How about your God? Everything answers to my God. You want to see a breakthrough in your life or in the lives of others? Then this is the time to enter into deeper, intimate, and robust <laughs> worship of your God and have victory in your lives. Hallelujah. Praise God with all your hearts. But we have to take the first steps. We got to open our mouth. Amen? We have to open our mouth. Hallelujah. Uh, um, is, is, is any of the musicians here? <laughs> No, they're not. You know what? Then let's, let's stand to our feet. I just want to close with this. I want us to sing that doxology, Praise God, From Whom All Blessings Flow. How many of you guys know that song? Go ahead. Come on in, guys. Well, let's, let's go ahead and sing that out loud right now. Let's, let's, let's practice some of these things. Let's, let's do some worship. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, Lord. Give the Lord a clap today and say, yeah! My God. If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ after listening to this message, or if you have any questions concerning our ministry here at Faith Outreach Center, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us through our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or you can call us at 574-223-7631. We would be happy to assist you in any way we can. 
On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless. <laughs>